Good evening, everyone. Welcome to um, our monthly or bi-monthly webinar from Sag Moraine Native Plant Community. My name is Catherine Bryla. I'm happy that you can all join us. We have a great attendance at this, uh, a great interest in attendance at this webinar. So I'm very excited to, to get this rolling. But before I do, I want to share a, a couple of things with you. Um, for those of you who are who signed up through Eventbrite or aren't familiar with Sag Moraine Native Plant Community, please visit our website, sagmoraine.org, and see the, we're very active and we have a lot of information on there. So please uh, visit us often and see the different things that we have going on as an organization. We are an all-volunteer 501c3 nonprofit organization that promotes the use of native plants in our urban and suburban landscapes. Couple of things I wanna share with you that are coming up. Uh, one is our seed exchange for those of you who live in the area that will be uh, come on out for coffee and hot chocolate at, at the Prairie Trails Library in Burbank, Illinois. Um, everyone's invited, bring your seeds, uh, take seeds home, share seeds and our Resident native plant expert Mark Hocksprung will be sharing some best practices at starting your native plants from seed. That will be on November 5th at 10 a.m. You can find more information on our website. And the other thing I want to mention is our photo share program. Please, oh please, if you live in the Chicago area, we need your photos. We, are, we have a new feature on our website where we are trying to share photos of people's native plants in their home and or business and or public landscapes so that we can get ideas from each other, um, be inspired by each other. And um, so you can, that we'll have, I, I believe Mary is putting that link in the chat uh, to share your photos. We would really appreciate it. We're really trying to uh, get that feature up and running in a big way to help us all out. Um, and now on to the main event, I want to introduce Chris Benda. Uh, Chris Benda, better known as the Illinois botanizer. Uh, he is a busy man and he is a botanist, researcher, teacher, photographer, and author. Uh, he is or has been affiliated with Illinois Native Plant Society, Southern Illinois University, University of Illinois, and the Morton Arboretum. He's going to, if, if anybody knows about the native plants of this beautiful prairie state that we call Illinois, it is Chris. Uh, he's going to be presenting tonight rare and showy plants of the Chicago region and the habitats that support them. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome Chris Benda. Hello, Chris. Welcome Hello. to you. Hello. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation to speak to your group. We're Wonderful. thrilled to have you. Excellent, excellent. Well, I put this program together for the Wild Things Conference that uh, the first one that I attended back in 2015, I believe it was. So it's uh, it's been revised a few times since then. And it's good to hear that it's going on again this year. We're back in business in person, or in, in 2023, I should say. Indeed, unfortunately, I, I I have planned the botanical humor talk that I have for the uh, Macon County Master Gardeners. So I won't be able to attend this year, but I, I'm sure the event will be terrific. You get around, Chris. You sure get around. <laughs> That's for sure. All righty. I'm going to bow out and let you take it away. Okay. So as mentioned, my name is Chris Benda, and I have current and former affili affiliations with lots of conservation organizations in Illinois. And currently, I work for the Plants of Concern program. So this is a partnership between the Chicago Botanic Garden and Southern Illinois University. The Plants of Concern program had been run, has been run out of the Chicago Botanic Garden for about 21 years. And in 2021, uh, they expanded the program to Southern Illinois and I was hired as the coordinator. So this is a, a volunteer um, rare plant monitoring program. And I also teach the flora of Southern Illinois at Southern Illinois University in the summertime, the summer semester is when that happens. Uh, as mentioned also, I was uh, involved with the Illinois Native Plant Society as state president years ago, I spent 10 years as the local Carbondale chapter president, and I still edit the newsletter. 
So if you're into native plants in Illinois, I definitely recommend that you check out the Illinois Native Plant Society. And uh, they have a lot of great, great events, especially in the Ch Chicago region, very active chapter up there and a lot of members. You can also find me online as the Illinois Botanizer uh, website appropriately called illinoisbotanizer.com. I have all the social media checked off, uh, mainly post on Instagram or on Facebook, but I try to do on Instagram as well. And I have several videos that I've created on my YouTube channel. So look at the content that I have made available online. And also I'm um, available for hire. So I give presentations throughout the state. One thing that um, has resulted from the pandemic is a lot more virtual programs like this one this evening. And that makes it uh, a little easier for folks to attend. In fact, if you go to my website at the bottom of every page, you can see that there's a subscription to the mailing list. If you want to, I have my speaking schedule on my website, but if you want to receive email notifications about events, you can subscribe with your email address and I will send those out. And there may be virtual presentations other groups are offering that you could attend in the future. But I also wanna draw your attention to the plant database that I have created on my website. I moved to Illinois in 2004 to go to graduate school, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. And so I've been botanizing and taking photos in Illinois for many years and I've made them available on my website. It is a work in progress, but I think I have over a thousand entries now for plants in the state. And also a thing that you may be interested in, um, I developed an online course with the excellent educators at the Morton Arboretum. It's called Botanical Names Demystified. And this is an on-demand online course you can enroll in at any time. I think there's 90 days that you act, give access for the course. And it's really um, a good primer that explains botanical names, what they mean, why they're used, all sorts of interesting information on that topic. And lastly, I want to just mention that I worked on the Cook County Forest Preserves resource, Natural Resources Master Plan in 2014 and 2015. So I actually lived in Palatine for three years in that time period. And um, I visited nearly all of the forest preserves in Cook County. And there are some really nice gems of sites in that region. So to start, I want to briefly tell the story of this gentleman. Many of you probably know him. His name is Dr. Gerald Wilhelm. And he wrote with his co-author, Laura Barica, the flora of Chicago region. It's a wonderful um, scientific tome it has all kinds of uh, information about how to identify native plants and introduce plants really in the Chicago region, all, all wild occurring plants. But in the back of the book, he mentions how he became a botanist and it's a useful story to con with the context of which um, relates to my presentation. So a really long and, and fascinating story short because I have a lot to share this evening. Um, Jerry's ascent into botany happened when he finished his university degree and was drafted uh, for the Vietnam War. And he was, um, you know, had a, had, a, had a bachelor's degree in science under his belt, and that helped the placement of someone with his skills for the Army. And he was actually assigned to the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in Lockport, actually in Vicksburg, Mississippi. <clears throat> So he reported for duty in Mississippi, and his first assignment was to go to Lockport, Illinois. There was a U.S. Corps of Engineers was planning to dredge the river there at Lockport, and they needed to put the dredge spoils somewhere on land. And they had identified 50 sites where this could occur, and he was to go evaluate them and rank them. This was, of course, thanks to the National Environmental Policy Act, which we call NEPA that requires a biological assessment, environmental review for federally funded projects. So he goes up to that area, not being a botanist, and he hooks up with Floyd Swink and Ray Schulenberg at the Morton Arboretum, and he takes them to these sites to help him evaluate them. And they look at plants and Ray is, you know, soft-spoken gentleman, and he would say to him, Oh, I see Dactylus glomerata and Taraxacum officinale and Ambrosia artemisiaefolia and 
you know, just kind of weedy plants. And he would say, don't worry, Jerry, you can spoil here. It will grow back. And then they went to what is now Lockport Prairie Nature Preserve. And he fell to his knees and started exclaiming, you know, Budalua Critipendula and Andropogon scoparius and, you know, all, all these different um, Latin names for prairie plants that they hadn't seen necessarily at these other sites. And he got all excited. And he looked up at Jerry and he said, Jerry, do not spoil here for this is America and it will not grow back. And of course, what he was saying was that this piece of ground that had the natural intact remnant vegetation of which had always occurred there, um, had evolved in this location, and that the landscape beyond that was so heavily altered <clears throat> and degraded that they weren't seeing these true Illinois American prairie plants on the environment. So this was a true intact remnant natural community and Jerry said that was his epiphany in life. He wanted to know that moment forward when he was standing in the true America. And so he needed to understand plants and their assemblages. So he did that. And in fact, he developed a concept that we call the coefficient of conservatism. And this basically is a way to quantify where you see plants on the landscape. So the definition here says natives, this is only for native species. Native species most successful in badly damaged habitats have a low C value, close to zero. Where on the other end of the spectrum, species virtually restricted to intact remnant natural communities, which we call natural areas, those receive a value close to 10. Now, uh, this was um, added onto later by the document listed there at the bottom. The Aerogenia is the journal of the Illinois Native Plant Society. And in 1997, they created a list of all the native plants known in Illinois at that time and assigned them a C value. So what you can do with this, one thing is you can go to a site, identify all the plants present there, and you can put it into the FQA calculator, which is listed there, the link at the bottom, and it'll spit out some metrics, a mean C value, C values for all the plants. It'll tell you what percentage of them are native and other really useful metrics that you can use to evaluate the natural quality of a particular parcel of land. So really cool um, product and concept that he devised from this experience um, through his work with the Corps of Engineers. So what are we talking about? These are these natural areas are high quality natural communities. So they're naturally occurring and they are in excellent condition for the most part. So they have retained or recovered their original natural character, need not be completely undisturbed, but we think of them as pristine or nearly pristine very high quality natural areas. And here's a picture of one of these. This is the Mezic Prairie at Wolf Road, Wolf Road Prairie Nature Preserve in Cook County, which has an interesting history and story of its own. So that these are the natural areas that I speak of uh, in this program. I also mentioned George Fell in all of my presentations. George Fell was the founder of the natural areas movement in the world, and he was from Rockford, Illinois. And he started the Nature Conservancy with his wife, Barbara. And he started the Natural Land Institute, which occurs to this day also in Rockford. And he basically recognized that we were losing natural areas at a rapid pace. And if we didn't do something to protect some of them, we would lose them all or potentially. So he wrote that basically at his time, we have to save these sites and set them aside because that will be all that will remain to pass from generation to the next. There will never be another chance. And he was so correct. He, he actually uh, devised, envisioned, and wrote legislation and championed the cause for the Illinois Nature Preserves Commission. And that is a state law that allows for the voluntary uh, protection of land in perpetuity. So Illinois now has over 600 nature preserves. And Illinois was the first state to devise a nature preserve system, a state law to protect land in the state. And it was really a model for a lot of other states to devise, um, develop their natural areas programs. So that was in the late 60s. And then in the 1970s, now that there was a way to protect land, um, really needed a project to identify all the remnants, natural communities that were remaining across the state. So that was the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory, the INAI. 
again, the first of its kind. This was a systematic statewide section by section, township by township review of all the natural sites remaining in the state. Five ecologists divided up the state and did this work for two or three years. And the project has you know, been continual since then, but at the, you know, the original several year push to look at all this, they found that just 0.07% of the land is in a pristine natural condition. So very small amount. In fact, Iowa is the only state that has um, less land in a, a high quality natural condition. But that being said, the map shows there are natural areas all throughout the state. In fact, every single one of the 102 counties in Illinois has at least one natural area. And there are a lot of them around Chicago region. And there are a lot of them where I currently reside in Southern Illinois. So that's one reason why I like this quote by E.O. Wilson that every scrap of biodiversity is priceless, never to be surrendered without a struggle. And unfortunately, as the statistic shows, what we have remaining in Illinois really are scraps in a lot of instances. They're small, but they are priceless. All right, I'm going to skip over the glacial history here, but go to the Illinois Natural Divisions chart. So you can see there are 14 natural divisions in Illinois. I could give a whole separate talk on the natural divisions present in the state. But for this program, uh, we're only going to talk about number three, the Northeastern Morainal Natural Division. And that is represented by the area in blue on the map. And you can see a number of sites that I have noted on the map that are some of my favorite places to visit in this region. And so we'll start with Illinois Beach Nature Preserve in Lake County. So I actually uh, moved to Lake County when I moved to Illinois. I moved in June of 2004. And I was going to start my master's degree studying Blanding's turtles. And so I was not at Illinois Beach, but I was nearby. And I was able to spend a lot of time here. And this whole site is just an absolute gem of a natural area. And on the south end, they have the nature preserve. And this was the first nature preserve that was dedicated in Illinois for the Nature Preserve Commission. And since Illinois was the first state to have such uh, a project, um, it's the first nature preserve in the nation. And in the parking lot, there's a sign that explains that. And in this picture, I wanna point out how, uh, the way I like to phrase it is that the plants are well-behaved. Um, they are distributed pretty evenly instead of being clumpy. And this is one thing that um, really displays high quality natural condition. So there are many factors that go into the analysis for determining if an area qualifies as a natural area, but really the two most important factors, in my opinion, are composition and structure. So composition is what species occur there. And it's not only um, the number of species, often a high number of species uh, indicates a lot of diversity, high quality, but also which species are there tells you a lot. And in particular, if there are a lot of conservative species present, those are the species then are that you really only find in these intact, pristine remnants. And then the structure is also very important, and that is the distribution of plants. So if you, you may have some conservative species there, maybe there's one individual, maybe there's more. So uh, we also want to consider what is the distribution of these uh, plant species across the particular natural community and the picture here shows good structure. Of course, nearby the beach is the Dead River, which uh, often does not make its way all the way to Lake Michigan. It's cut off by a sand plug. And so that's why they call it the Dead River. It's, it's kind of like a slough in that regard. But in some times of the year, it does connect and flow out to the lake. But you can see the different natural communities here where it's a little bit wetter. But one of the interesting things about this site is it has um, <clears throat> what we call a pan present. And a pan is, is spelled P-A-N-N-E. And the pan is basically the swale portion of the dune and swale topography along the beach. If you look at a Google Earth image of Illinois Beach Nature Preserve in Illinois Beach area, you can see these lines running basically parallel with the shoreline. And that is the undulating topography of the dune and swale of basically the, the lake is sort of moving back and forth as it's generally receding over time. Um, but 
you know, fluctuating and creating this, uh, this terrain. And so in the swale where it's wet, you have this uh, plant called twig rush, which is not a rush, it's a sedge, uh, but it's called Cladium maroscoides. And that's all the little brown uh, seed heads that you can see in the photo. And native loosestrife is mixed in as well. And then where it's high and dry in the dune part, um, you have different veg vegetation. So very high, the, the pan ecosystem is globally rare. It's really only found with um, large bodies of water around there. So some of the rare plants and showy plants that inhabit this particular habitat, the, the main component of the beach is marum grass. And marum grass is Amophila breviligulata. It's an Illinois threatened species. Um, it's really a lot of the beach dwellers that occur only on the beach in Illinois are rare because we have so little beach habitat in the state. Most of it is the extreme northeastern portion along Lake Michigan. So there's marum grass and here's the worldwide distribution. You can see it's basically on coastal areas around the Great Lakes and the Atlantic coastline. This is the marum grass. Then we also have in this ecosystem the pitcher's thistle. And uh, I need to update my photo. I got an excellent photo of it blooming um, in 20, 2021 at the Illinois, or at, excuse me, at the Indiana Dunes. We do have this in Illinois. It's something we consider, something that has been uh, extirpated in the state. Extirpated means locally extinct. So the, one, the natural populations in Illinois have all perished, but it has been introduced in former habitat like at Illinois Beach State Park. And the pitcher's thistle, um, is an interesting one to highlight because most people, I think, generally think of thistles as uh, unwanted lawn plants, but we actually have several conservative uh, species of thistle in Illinois, including Circium pitcheri. And they, this is um, a monocarpic plant, which means that they flower once. They're basically biennials, I think, for the most part. They exist as a basal rosette, and then they'll flower, and after they flower, they die. So that, of course, may contribute a little bit to the population dynamics there um, for that particular plant. And this is a federally threatened species. So Illinois has their own list of, of uh, endangered and threatened plants and animals. Um, and then the feds had maintained a different list. And this one is federally threatened. And if you look at the distribution here, we can see that it's centered around the Great Lakes. And that makes it pretty rare. So it looks like Michigan is probably the stronghold for this particular species. We have other things that grow on the sand. We have seaside spurge, got a fun name, Camasyche polygonifolia, Illinois endangered, little, it's, it's a, a euphorb basically in the spurge family. You see the range there as well, coastal species. We also have sea rocket, Cachile lacustris. Um, actually, the, there's been a little bit of changing here because there's a European uh, variety or species that has been found to occur on the beach as well. And they're actually fairly similar. It's not something that I've, I've worked out entirely yet. Um, with the pandemic and living in Southern Illinois, I haven't been able to botanize uh, as much as I've wanted in the Chicago region, but this is a, a mustard. And so it's interesting to see that out on the beach, but be aware there is a, a lookalike European species as well. And we see this one additionally centered around coastal regions in the Great Lakes. Now, trailing juniper is an Illinois endangered species as well, but it covers the sand dunes at Illinois Beach State Park. So that's a great place to go see uh, Juniperus horizontalis. You see a lot of blazing star mixed in in that photo there. You can see the range, this is a Northern species. So Illinois, Northern Illinois is really the Southern edge of the range for a lot of plants that are much more common to the north. So that makes it uh, interesting botanizing. Another plant that I like that grows in the wetter areas of the sand is a uh, colic root. That's a uh, Electris farinosa. Beautiful, beautiful little dainty white flowered plant. And we can see the range on there. It's, um, it's rare, I would say, but not Illinois threatened or endangered. You see a number of counties in Chicago region for that one. Also in this community type, we have the Calm St. John's wort, Hypericum calmanium. And that is um, a shrubby species of St. John's wort. 
We actually, from the Florida of Chicago region work that Jerry and Laura did, they named, um, I think at least two, maybe more species as new to science that were um, basically determined from herbarium specimens. And they named a new species of Hypericum after their mentor and excellent botanist Floyd Swink. So there is a Hypericum swinkianum now that's found in Illinois on these same types of sites. And you see the range for this particular Hypericum more common to the north. I mentioned that I moved to Illinois to go to graduate school. I studied Blanding's turtles. So here's a picture of one of those. And they are basically centered around the Great Lakes region as well with just junk populations out in Nebraska and Massachusetts and even Nova Scotia, which I had the opportunity to visit uh, when I was working on my degree there. So really interesting animals to throw in with the plant presentation. So the next slide I wanna feature is Volo Bog. And um, honestly, uh, te technical, technically speaking, there are no true bogs in Illinois. This would be considered a poor fen. And a poor fen is basically um, a wetland that is a little bit more on the acidic side than basic. It's still um, basic in pH, but you know, not quite as far as what we would call a calcareous fen, which I'll feature later. But there are bog loving plants that occur here, regardless of what community type it's called, including the tamarack trees that you can see in the background. So tamarack is a deciduous conifer. They drop their needles this time of year um, and they grow in these wetland swamps. And we're at the Southern edge of the range here in Southern Illinois, in Northern Illinois, excuse me. Uh, and we'll also, if you, there's a boardwalk that you can walk on that'll take you out into the bog area, the open water center of of the site. And you can see neat plants along the way like water arum, calipalustris. You see the range here, just one county. It's actually, th these maps are from BONAP, uh, the, the, the Biota of North America program. And they're pretty good, but there's a few inconsistencies I've noticed. This We actually have this one from two counties, uh, Lake and Cook in Illinois, but Illinois endangered. And then one of my most favorite photos ever is the bog buckbean. You know, go up to Canada and you'll see bog buck bean all over the place. It's common in, in Canada, but we're at the southern edge of its range. So Minyanthes trifoliata, Illinois endangered, beautiful little wildflower that likes this habitat. You can see the range there. I've only seen it at Volo Bog, so it's interesting that there are other counties mapped. And sometimes if there's other counties mapped, that means that it once occurred there. It's been, it's been observed in that county. It doesn't mean that it's necessarily still present today. Um, so that's interesting to keep in mind. And then also, you know, like I said, there's lots of rare plants because this is a rare community type in Illinois. One of the shrubs you'll see along the way is a little uh, related to blueberries, which is the Ericaceae. This is leather leaf. It has a name that I like as well, Camadaphne colliculata. And you can find those blooming, I think it was in May, towards the end of May, took this photo there years ago. And you see the range there on that, pretty common in you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, and the Northeast, but in Illinois, we're at the Southern edge of its range. Okay, let's move on to another site. I mentioned uh, calcareous fens. Uh, there are several at Bluff Spring Fen Nature Preserve, which is in Elgin. You can park at the cemetery and walk into the site. Um, in addition to the fens, they have a couple gravel prairies there that have been constructed. So this is a beautiful scene there in June of the gravel prairie at Bluff Spring Fen, but the, the site is really protecting the wetlands that are present there. And this is, a, a, this is actually a seep, a calcareous seep. So calcareous means full of calcium, which means that it's alkaline or basic on the pH scale. And plants, like all organisms or most organisms, are adapted to a pretty specific pH level. So you're gonna find different plants that are occurring in these alkaline areas. The, the, the grass there that's the brown is a Descampsia species, but there's other little neat wetland plants in there. I'm standing on the trail so you can observe the wetland without you know, going into it, which you know this is often kind of like quicksand. So it's good to stay out of the wetland and not leave any you know, footprints and things. But you can see neat plants from the trail. Here's another <clears throat> high quality fen. 
at Lake in the Hills Fen Nature Reserve in the town of Lake in the Hills in McHenry County, you know, a pretty large site. And I think, you know, to the average observer, you may look at this and, and not think anything special about it, but this is a really rare, high quality ecosystem right here with different, uh, you, you know, unique vegetation that occurs in them. And so fens and seeps are somewhat similar, kind of, you know, there's slight differences to them. In more of the seep springs, you can find marsh marigold, which blooms early in April, Cathopalustris, and that's a beautiful wildflower you see in these, you know, wet woods and wet seeps in the Chicago land. Another one that I really like, it blooms late in the year, more in the, in August, I suppose, is a grass of Parnassus, Parnassia glauca. You can see the range there on that one, mostly to the north. We have other Parnassias that are in the southeast, but for the species that occurs in Illinois, that's the only one. Uh, oh, and then this one is really pretty and, and not commonly seen. This is the lesser fringe gentian. So more common is just the regular fringe gentian that grows in prairies and, you know, wetter spots. But this is restricted to fens is the gentianopsis virgata. And it is a smaller plant, as the common name implies, but also the fringing, the fringes on the petals are not as, as deep, not, not as lobed and divided. So it's a beautiful blue wildflower that um, actually blooms late in the year, about September, maybe even in October. And you see the range for that species. And white turtlehead is actually common across Illinois, um, particularly in the north, but it likes wetlands, particularly fens. Kiloni glabra, the white turtlehead. And it's interesting, it is a host plant for the Baltimore checker spot which is a rare butterfly in Illinois, one that I had a chance to see several years ago and get this photograph. So we see the range on the Kiloni glabra, and like I said, pretty much throughout the state, um, mostly to the north and east of Illinois. Another dainty little wildflower is the Calms lobelia, lobelia calmii. So if you're familiar with cardinal flower, it's a beautiful red wildflower. This is related to that. This is a tiny, just little, you know, flower, thread-like leaves um, that grows only in these high-quality uh, fens. You can see the range there on the Calms lobelia. So I think it's fairly rare, not rare enough, I guess, to make the state endangered list or threatened, but there's a number of counties where it occurs in Illinois. And then a site that I really enjoy in, also in Elgin, on the Kane County side, is Trout Park Nature Preserve. And it's a small site, but there is a, a boardwalk that allows you to walk through the wetland and see marsh marigold and see skunk cabbage and other interesting plants that occur there, including white cedar. So white cedar is fairly common in Wisconsin, far, places farther north, but in Illinois, it actually used to be um, on the state listed species list, but it was taken off, it was found to be more common. It's at Starved Rock and you know, a few of these uh, mesic ravine sites, but also along the Fox River there at Trout Park. And again, you see the range there, just a few counties in Illinois, more common to the north and northeast. Now moving over to Schaumburg. I mentioned I lived in Palatine for a few years. So uh, Bussey Forest Nature Preserve was nearby and it is a large site there. It's actually an Elk Grove village, but you know, adjacent to Schaumburg. Um, and they have flatwoods there and flatwoods, it's a northern flatwoods is the community type name. And these are areas that have what we call a fragipan, which is a layer of clay about six to eight inches on, below the surface. And, you know, clay doesn't drain water very well. It, it ponds it, it pools it up. So it creates these uh, ephemeral wetlands, which are, you know, great places for wildlife and other plants adapted to those types of sites. Uh, there's the cardinal flower I mentioned earlier. So that one's not um, specific to flatwoods, but does occur in a variety of wetlands. And then swamp white oak, Quercus bicolor, is a common component of a lot of these flatwood sites. This one at um, Potawatomi Woods. But another plant that is kind of rare that you can find in these northern flatwoods is uh, what I call cousin it sedge. So Carex bromoides. You can see the clumps, it's a clump former sedge. So sedges are grass-like plants 
uh, but they're not grasses, they're sedges. But they, uh, we have 193 species of just Carex sedges in Illinois. So it's a diverse group of plants that are hard to ID, uh, but this one is fairly easy because of the, just the growth form that it exhibits. And that can actually be seen um, in Northern Illinois and Southern Illinois. It's got an interesting distribution there, but is listed in the state. And then newts, you, the newts are one of the, they're, they're a type of salamander that can occur in these um, ephemeral ponds, like I mentioned. And I, may, I mainly put this in the slideshow so that I could tell you my newt joke that I once had a pet newt named Tiny and I named him Tiny because he was my newt. But I'm ching. So you can see newts, they're really cool creatures. But again, I'm mainly talking about plants in this presentation. So also interesting across the, uh, the Chicago region are savanna sites. And honestly, savannas were sort of poor, poorly known and understood during the time of the INAI in the 70s. So there weren't a lot of savanna sites that were identified and placed on the INAI. Uh, one that I worked on to add to the list uh, occurs at Baker's Lake. So Baker's Lake is in Barrington, so Northwest Cook County. And you can drive, I mean, I'm basically in the parking lot almost where I'm taking this photo. You can drive right up to the site, take a nice stroll in there across the Bur Bur Oaks. The Bur Oak is the common component of our oak savannas, as well as a number of other species like the aptly named Savannah Blazing Star, Liatra scariosa variety Newlandii, which used to be listed and was taken off the list. We have a number of plants that have either recovered or just more locations were found over time um, that allowed for them to be removed. So I think that it's a common story, and, and rightly so, that we have really damaged the environment in Illinois and beyond a lot. But there are success stories. There are plants that, um, for various reasons, have recovered to the point where they've been removed from the rare plant list. Another uh, species that occurs in these savanna types is sweet fern, which I don't encounter very often in Illinois. Um, Comptonia peregrina. This is not a fern. It is a flowering plant but it's fern-like, so it gets that name. And it grows often in pretty large clumps. And you can see the range there, just a few counties. In Illinois, like a lot of these plants, more common uh, to the north and to the northeast. Now, this plant here is probably the rarest species of milkweed in Illinois. There are 18 native species of milkweeds, Asclepius milkweeds in Illinois. And this, uh, I've actually seen them all. A number of them are very rare. There's one that only grows on hill prairies on the Western edge of the state that I was actually finally able to see and photograph last June. That completed my search for all 18 native uh, Asclepius milkweed species in Illinois. This one is Asclepius ovalifolia, the oval leaf milkweed. It was actually thought extirpated for 40 years or so, decades. And it was just rediscovered in a Cook County Forest Preserve in, I think it was the 1980s, 1986. They're struggling. I took this picture in 2013. Um, I'm glad I was able to see it and get such a lovely photo because uh, from what I hear, they're not doing very well on the site. Um, a number of our rare milkweeds are having problems that there's a, there's a number of factors. Um, pop, low population size is probably uh, the biggest factor, which also contributes to um, the genetic uh, inbreeding. There, there is a genetic bottleneck. There's not enough diversity in the genes to have successful reproduction. So it's a lot of, we call them the same geriatric plants bloom every year and they don't really make seed. And so it's hard to keep them continuing. But this does at least currently still occur at that site um, in Cook County. Another one in the savannas is a pale vetchling, Lathrus ochralucus. You see the pale colored flowers there. It said the, the base of the leaflets there have a, a different type of leaf called a stipule and they're very distinct stipule on this particular vetch, um, which of course is a pea in the pea family, the base E. And so they're neat ones to find. You can see the range there, Northern Illinois, for the most part only. Okay, now let's go look in some woodlands here. And a really nice woodland occurs at Deer Grove. This is actually Deer Grove West. A lot of restoration has been going on at Deer Grove East. And, you know, we can restore areas to make them better. Um, but I wanna stress that 
for a lot of these natural communities, once they get significantly altered, they'll never be the same, particularly our prairie types. Once they're plowed, it will never be really the same true prairie type again. Now, we have limited examples where a lot of work and time and effort has gone into making these natural communities better and more, you know, they're enhanced and higher quality. But it's really important that we preserve what's remaining uh, in addition to restoring any degraded areas. So Deer Grove West has, uh, <laughs> excuse me, high quality um, dry mesic woodland present. And these woodlands are often really nice to visit in the spring when you have the spring ephemerals blooming. And one of the plants that likes to occur in these habitats, it's somewhat on the rare side, is the bishop's cap, Vitella defila. The bishop's cap, the name here um, is actually referring to the leaves, which have a triangular shape to them, sort of like a bishop's cap. Um, but I think that whoever named this plant must not have seen it flowering because why would you not give it a common name based on these beautiful intricate snowflake looking flowers very small and beautiful uh, on the plant that's called bishop's cap and we actually have this in southern illinois and even south of southern illinois but um, throughout most of illinois it's it's pretty rare species <coughs> also exciting um, in a woodland in Cook County, during the project I referenced earlier, I found a new population of this rarity, the black cohosh, Actea racemosa. And any uh, botanically astute individuals may notice that uh, it is no longer in the genus uh, Simicifuga or Simicifuga. Those have been reclassified into Actea, which is the genus that includes doll's eyes, which um, they have some similarity to, but it's a much larger plant. They're often six, eight feet tall with this nice white spike of flowers. Very rare in Illinois. See, this is the you know, known distribution, mostly uh, more common to the east, but um, kind of peculiar. It's also a lot of it in Missouri there and even Arkansas. So another nice uh, woodland occurs in Cook County at Cap Sowers Nature Preserve. This is a pretty large site. Um, they have a nice trail through the woods they call the Esker Trail. And in fact, there's even, um, there's a little prairie back in there, struggling to remember the name. But anyway, a lot of restoration has occurred throughout here, and it's a lovely place to visit and see high quality woodland in Illinois. And then another site that I'm particularly fond of, because as I mentioned, I lived in Palatine uh, for several years, is Palatine Prairie Nature Preserve. So a lot of the prairies that remain in a high quality condition in Illinois are in cemeteries or along railroads, because those were areas that were undeveloped and unplowed. And you can see this one along the metro line uh, in the town of Palatine. It's owned by the city of Palatine. And it's high quality. It, it's facing a number of uh, threats. Crown vetch is a, is a big issue. But I believe that there are work, regular work days that occur there now. And so there are volunteers trying to help preserve this site. It, it is a, a true gem. And then another one of my really favorite sites in Cook County as well is Shoe Factory Road Prairie Nature Preserve. This is a gravel prairie. So, you know, Illinois is the prairie state. You have very little prairie that's remaining. Uh, there's estimated that of the 36 million acres that encompasses Illinois, 22 million were formerly in a prairie type. And now we have about 2,200 high quality acres of prairie remaining. So we've really um, destroyed, honestly, and altered a lot of the prairie in the state. And of course, that's because <clears throat> at least the black soil prairie is, is among the richest farmland in the world. And we've converted to agriculture. But prairie does exist throughout um, Illinois, including at the site here. It's along Shoe Factory Road, so it's uh, aptly named, and it's in Schaumburg. And you can see, again, this is another picture that I really enjoy that really displays the high-quality structure. So the white plants are wild quinine, the yellow is prairie coreopsis, the purple are 
lead plants. And you see how there's, you know, big blue stem there, but it's a, it's not a major component in the prairie. So high quality prairies typically um, have a, a good composition of forbs as well as grasses. And then another site here that's really a gem that I always try to visit whenever I'm up in Chicago land is Somme Prairie Grove Nature Preserve. So this is part of the Somme complex in Northbrook, Illinois. And on the west end of the complex is Somme Prairie Nature Preserve. And then adjacent to that is Somme Prairie Grove, just in the middle of three sites. And then on the other side of, um, forget if it's Waukegan Road, I think, um, is Somme Woods, which I believe is also a nature preserve now as well. So three nature preserves there. And it, particularly at Somme Prairie Grove, uh, Steve Packard and the North Branch volunteers have put a lot of time and effort into restoring, which is basically former pasture to high quality prairie and savanna. You can see the prairie dock there, lead plant, butterfly milkweed, rattlesnake master. And a true prairie remnant, this actually was not identified during the INAI. This was found later. Um, the story I heard was that there was um, a photography class that was going on in the area of Downers Grove, where this prairie occurs. And one of the participants took pictures of these you know, prairie plants for, for the class. And it intrigued the interest from others to, to figure out where, where was this site. And it um, was then identified and, and made a nature preserve. I think this is also owned by <clears throat> the park district there called Belmont Prairie. And it is very close to the Morton Arboretum where I've done a lot of teaching in the past. The pandemic kind of put an end to a lot of my programming that now that I work full time at university has not come back, but I used to spend a lot of time at this prairie. And it's again, it's small. You can drive right up to it, parking lot, and there's little pavers that you can follow to get out into the prairie. You see some sumac encroachment there. You know, it takes a lot of, of work to um, regularly, you know, have prescribed fires or do some mechanical removal. Uh, sumac is a native species, but it really shouldn't be in, in uh, large numbers on a prairie. But you do see blazing star and uh, the gray-headed coneflower and other prairie plants. So a true gem of a prairie is at Belmont Prairie. And then this one here is a dolomite prairie at Lockport Prairie Nature Preserve. So I mentioned this site when I was talking about Jerry Wilhelm at the beginning. And this is on the Des Plaines River where the, the Kankakee Torrent occurred. And that was basically, you know, during the last glacial episode, um, an ice dam formed and it pooled up glacial meltwater into a big lake. And then the ice melted and breached and it basically released all of this uh, water in a torrent that you know, rushed through the valley and scoured all the, the soil down to bedrock. And the dolomite is a, is a horizontal uh, forming rock. And so it's very shallow soil in these prairies and that you know, lends to particular species that occur in them as well. And one of the rarest ones really in Illinois is the lakeside daisy. In fact, rarest in the world. Um, this is another one that is considered extirpated from Illinois. The natural populations were all uh, destroyed, but they have put plants back at a, a couple sites, at least, if not a few more, uh, including this site here. And you can so you can still see Lakeside Daisy in the Dolomite Prairie. This is an interest, interesting distribution here. So this is federally threatened, but only the counties in yellow are where it has been known to occur. So in Illinois, it's gone from all those sites. Like I said, it's been replanted basically. Other than that, then it's only in one county in Ohio and a few counties in uh, the upper peninsula of Michigan. But I think at least one of these sites, they call it Lakeside Daisy Preserve because it's the dominant plant there. And that's probably why it's not federally endangered considering how localized its distribution is. So federally threatened species, it does persist. Um, I think the plants, some of the plants at least that were planted back at these sites uh, came from the original stock. So local genes are important. Um, we've been able to put that back on the landscape. And another little flower that I wonder if it should be listed in Illinois is the Carolina anemone. 
anemone caroliniana. I think it might have moved out of anemone now. You know, the they call it the, the, there's a revolution going on in taxonomy, which has honestly been continual since you know Linnaeus's time. But a lot of the uh, plants are being reclassified as we have a better understanding of their uh, phylogeny. And this one is I've actually only seen this one time, and it was um, in Will County and a Dolomite Prairie. So they're sometimes blue, sometimes white. The abundance fluctuates greatly, which is one reason why they're kind of hard to study. But we can look at the range here, more common to the west, west and south, of Illinois. And another plant particular to the Dolomite Prairie is this little quillwort. So you may have heard of plants that are called fern allies. We joke and say, yes, the fern allies, they were the defenders of the ferns during the Great Plant Wars. But no, it's basically saying that they reproduce with spores like ferns do, but they're not true ferns. So you call them fern allies, or you can call them lycophytes. Now, quillwort here, um, you can see it has a bulb there, which is one way to easily identify because it, it looks kind of like a little, little grass. There's, you know, it it's not, doesn't produce flowers, so there's not a whole lot to see to identify it. Um, I, this is coincidentally a more common species that I dug up for this photo. I didn't, didn't dig up a rare uh, isoetes for that. It's a different species, but it shows um, the bulb there at the base. This is an interesting one in that it was not known from Illinois. Uh, John Schwegman was a state botanist for the state for his entire career. And I think he retired in maybe 2000. He's, he's, uh, he lives in Southern Illinois. I actually talked to him. Uh, I talked to him just the other day. Um, and anyway, he learned from another botanist that this was, being, this was discovered somewhere. I forget all the particulars, but basically he said, Go, you should look for this plant on Dolomite Prairie. And John went up to, I think it's the Displains Conservation Area up there in Will County and found it immediately. It's new to the state and Illinois endangered, but I, I think at some sites where it occurs, there are hundreds of plants. So it's uh, very locally distributed, but perhaps not super rare uh, where it does occur. As you can see the range there, it's kind of interesting. You'd think that if it was going to be found in Illinois, it would be in the southern part of the state, but <clears throat> it's a little more southern in distribution. And then another rare plant that is also an annual, it fluctuates in abundance from year to year, is the uh, Minuartia patula, which I think also may have a, a revised name, uh, but that's the name I learned for the slender sandwort, which is a, in the pink family. Little five-petaled white flowers there, they're the cleft petals. And you see the range there, also peculiar that um, Seems to be a little more common to the south, but yet here it is in northeast Illinois. And the same is true for leafy prairie clover. Strange distribution I'll show in a minute, but this is the only federally endangered species of plant in Illinois. So there are a handful of federally threatened examples, some of which I mentioned earlier, but this one here is the only federally endangered plant in Illinois, and it was also thought extirpated for many years and was rediscovered in Dolomite Prairie in Will County, I think in the 70s perhaps, but it occurs at a couple sites at least. Um, and it's it's doing well where, 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 where it still uh, persists. But look at the range here. It's only known from four states. This is the worldwide distribution. Uh, Wisconsin, Illinois, Tennessee, and Alabama. So kind of interesting there how it's uh, distributed across the states. And then some other plants of the prairie I want to mention. The, the, the title was showy plants as well as rare plants. And this is definitely a showstopper, the queen of the prairie, Philopendula rubra. Some of these rare plants are actually fairly easy to buy and grow. But, and that's true for this one, but naturally occurring populations are rare. And so this one is still on the only threatened list. It likes um, wet prairies, the wet side of things. And it is a fairly large plant when it's blooming. You see the range there was at least at one time known from a number of counties, it looks like along the Illinois River mainly. And then this stunner here is the prairie lily, Lilium philadelphicum uh, variety andinum. Also, uh, 
you know, there's not a lot of red or orange flowers in the landscape. So that really makes these stand out. Lilies are just, you know, such beautiful plants. Um, they consider them deer candy, though. The, the deer like to eat the flowers. So th these were actually caged at this site. And the steward was with me and removed the cage so I could take this photograph of the splendid prairie lily. And you can see the range there, mostly northern Illinois for that one. Another beauty in the prairie sites is meadow beauty. Rexia virginica also likes wet prairies. Um, I've seen this in Cook County at a couple sites. And it is really neat. It's got these crazy looking yellow anthers on it. Um, so that makes it unique. And there's several other similar species. You see the distribution there. I've actually seen this species in, in Southern Illinois, close to where I live. And it's more common to the South and East but it's in northeast part of the state. And then this stunner here, the prairie gentian, Gentiana puberulenta. Now the gentians bloom in you know, September, even in October, which is nice because it's good to see some color late in the year. Plus they just, you know, blue is about as rare, it's probably more rare than red. You know, most wildflowers are white and yellow and purple or pink. So blue and red and orange are really, more uncommon, um, but this is a nice just sort of deep blue color and it's only in high quality prairie sites. So it's a conservative species. You can see it has a distribution throughout the state. Another beautiful, rare and showy plant prairies in Illinois is the uh, scarlet uh, paint cup. It's really the more appropriate name I think to use here, Castalesia coccinea. I also want to mention that there is a, a yellow, these can sometimes have yellow uh, bracts on them. Actually, if you look closely, the, the flowers, the, the red parts are not the flowers. Those are colorful bracts. A bract is basically a modified leaf that is associated with a flower. And sometimes the bracts are yellow, but it's the same species. So an interesting one to occur. And in fact, I have not seen this plant very much in Illinois. Um, my research site up in Lake County, I saw it, but <clears throat> can't think of many other places. Nechusa grasslands probably has some. And you see the range there, you know, it's mapped for a lot of counties in Illinois, even though this is a really hard one to, to, to find. You have to go, it's a conservative species. You have to go to these intact um, remnant natural communities. And then I want to end this, or I'm going to have a few slides here as I get to the end of my slideshow where I want to highlight some orchids. So I, like a lot of people, am an orchid nut, but I don't buy orchids or really, you know, have any from the grocery store or belong to any orchid societies. I like native orchids. And in Illinois, I have actually have an uh, Orchids of Illinois talk. Um, and in it, I mentioned how there are 55 species that were once known from the state, and I believe we're down to 40. So a number of orchids that were once occurred in Illinois no longer occur in Illinois. But this one does, the white lady slipper orchid, Cypripedium canditum. And these are small. It's, it's really kind of difficult to appreciate how dainty and small these plants are and these flowers. I mean, they're maybe the size of my thumbnail. I mean, they're just little white uh, lady slipper orchids and they like prairies and often in somewhat abundance. This is another plant species that was on the Illinois threatened list for a long time and it has recovered. They've, they've moved some into new sites, sites that they were known to occur, they've expanded. So it was removed from the list um, a couple list reviews ago. And there's quite a few places actually in Chicagoland where you can see these, but only again in these high quality intact remnant natural communities, mostly wet prairie. And you see the range there, at least at one time, um, it was known in all those counties in yellow in Illinois and beyond. Now let's look at a couple grass pink orchids. This is Calipogon tuberosus and as the common name implies, if you know, this is an impossible plant to find if it is not blooming. Um, it has a single leaf that looks like a blade of grass. So it really blends in in the grasses where it, you know, it, it occurs. But when they bloom, they're just exquisitely beautiful. 
Another interesting fact about the Calipogon orchids is a lot of orchids have what we call resupinid flowers. And that means as the flowers form, they twist. And so they're actually upside down. That's what resupinid means. But this is a non resupinid example where the lip is actually on the top of the flower. So it does not twist and, and, and form like that. But this is rare in Illinois, again, in, in wet prairie types. And you can see the distribution there in Illinois. But much rarer and really was thought to be the same thing. And then in the 90s, it was found as a new species described from Oklahoma. And I think actually in Missouri is where they found it. But it, the heart of its range is Oklahoma. So they call it the Calipogon oklahomensis, the Oklahoma grass pink orchid. I took this uh, great photo on uh, June 9th of 2013. And I've never seen this flower again. I've actually been to this site a number of times and could not find any, but it has been seen at a few other sites all in Will County. So it does, it does, um, it is still in Illinois, but it is very rare. And you can see the range here. So the map would indicate it's in Kane County, but it's actually in Will County. But in any event, just a single county, Illinois. And it, in fact, um, the excellent website, Minnesota Wildflowers, has uses my photo to have this um, side by side that explains some of the differences between the, the regular uh, grass pink orchid and the Oklahoma grass pink orchid. So check out Minnesota Wildflowers website. You can see that photo and other great plants. And then just a couple more here, I think. Uh, this is the, they call it the yellow fringed orchid. Um, looks pretty orange to me, but in any event, it's Platanthera ciliaris. And it is a stunning beauty. Now, this one blooms at the end of July. There are two sites in Illinois where it occurs. And at one of them, it actually occurs by the hundreds. And it's a good place to go see these. It also likes <clears throat> wet prairie types. You see the range there, Cook, Will, and Union. The Union County one is, uh, hasn't been seen for a long time. I think that's all farmland now, but Will and Cook it persists to this day. And then it's, it's uh, similar to this Platanthera, Platanthera psychoides, the purple fringed orchid. Also very rare. Also likes wet places. Not so much prairie, more of um, sedge meadow. So it, it grows under a canopy typically um, in like flatwood, sedge meadow, wet, forested types. And it is just exquisite wildflower. I mean, these are so rare, I shouldn't even be talking to you about them. But we need to share the beauty of Illinois. We need to inspire people to want to protect and engage with the environments so that we can preserve these places. So I want to show you some of the rarest, some of the most beautiful examples that we have. In fact, at this site one year, which I visited uh, many, many years in a row. I haven't been there in a while, but I found a white form. So a lot, pretty much most wildflowers that are colorful can be white. I mean, they're basically, you know, albino versions. Um, but I read that the white purple fringed orchids are very rare. And I saw one there on one of my visits that you can see pictured there. So that was pretty exciting. And here's the range, just a few counties in Northeast Illinois. And then another Platanthera, this is actually sort of, this could be a poster child for Illinois. The prairie state is the Eastern Prairie Fringed Orchid. There used to be one species um, throughout North America and they actually split them into two. So now we have the Western Prairie Fringed Orchid and Eastern Prairie Fringed Orchid. In Illinois, we just have the Easterns, but I think Minnesota has both and maybe Missouri, but in, in Illinois, they're all the Eastern um, federally threatened species. This was a common prairie plant at one time and we've converted all the prairie pretty much to farmland. So it's a hard one to find, but we've actually, um, there's been a successful recovery effort over 20 year period by Fish and Wildlife Service and their partners to put this one back on the landscape. And so you can see it at a number of sites. Uh, Nechusa grasslands actually has a healthy population, as well as a few places in the Cook, uh, the Chicago region. And it is the beautiful orchid <clears throat> in Illinois. You see the range there. You know, once known throughout the state, but really um, just just a few sites now 
Uh, but like I said, more common than it used to be because we've, we've been pretty successful uh, recovering it, but it is still listed federally threatened. So there you have it. There is the whirlwind tour of rare and showy plants of the Chicago region. I hope that you enjoyed the slideshow and learned a lot. Um, be sure to check out my website. I have my speaking schedule listed there. Um, I actually am giving uh, another virtual program for Lake Bluff chapter. Is it Wild Ones? I have to look at to see, but I have, a, I have a different program next week. So check that out if you're interested. That'll be on Zoom. And if you um, wanted to contact me, I am appropriately at botanizer at gmail.com. So thanks for your attention, and I would be happy to answer any questions. Well, thank you so much, Chris. That When I look at that, what I find amazing is living in the Chicago area, we feel like we're so urban, we're so suburban. You drive around, you, it's just traffic and, and mayhem, and you don't realize how this area is a holdout for so many different species of plants. You know, you see the whole state and it's not there. And we think of there being more open land, but but how many plants that, that our congested area is, is a holdout for? It's kind of amazing. It is really amazing. You know, in between all the development there, there are a lot, I mean, every county has their own forest preserve district. And so they have places where plants, you know, still occur on landscape and so it is really rich and, and you wouldn't expect that you know go to go to LA go to New York you know they have rare plants in places where rare plants grow but not even close to the kind of stuff that we have around Chicagoland. It, 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 yeah amazing we do have a few questions um for all the sites you listed is there public access and are there trails uh to walk on for all of them so um, I, I or is believe, it a secret where these things are? <laughs> are well, they I mean, we do need to protect them, and 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 in Chicago land is you know five million people in Cook County, so there there are um, poaching is a serious concern, and so there does there, you know we do need to have some protection for the plants, but um, all these sites are publicly owned. Um, I can't think of any offhand that are close to the public. Um, as far as trails go. For the most part, there are trails that will take you there, and I do recommend that you stay on the trail. Um, so, you know, kind of thinking through the, the places that I had on the list, I, I think you can visit them all and, and walk a trail. Now, whether or not you see these plants, you got to be at the right time of the year and, you know, mm -hmm. be a keen observer, um, mm -hmm. but they're, they're still present there. You oh. said today you came from Rockford. Yes. Um, were were you up have anything to do with the Bell Bowl Prairie or and, and is there any progress on that? So I spoke to the basically the Rockford area Audubon group um, for their 50th anniversary about gravel prairies, remnant gravel prairies in general in Illinois, and a lot of the same content that I covered at the beginning of the slideshow, and it was partially about Bell Bowl. Um, they invited me to a rally um, last year about this time when it was unclear what was going to happen. Um, so I was trying to, you know, engage the audience with the rarity of Bell Bowl. Um, not much has occurred. So the in the in the sense of the prairie is still there. The airport board, um, frankly, has no interest in preserving it. And so they have already created and bulldozed a roadway right up to the fence on the edge of the prairie you used to be able to go out there and bird or whatever and it was just no like hardly anybody knew about it or went which may be part of the problem of why you know but any event um they are going through a, another evaluation review and they're waiting for the results but it appears um very likely that it will be destroyed um, at least a significant portion of the prairie. So th they want to bulldoze a road through it. And so prairie will still occur on each side of the road, but the road is going to have a massive impact. Um, there, no, I don't, I don't know uh, a lot of what's in the works and I, and I may not, and perhaps I shouldn't um, speculate on what the 
uh, possibilities are remaining to save the prairie, but essentially mm -hmm. the airport board, which are appointed members, um, have the control, they have the power, and they are not interested in entertaining alternatives. So they're fully uh, in support of continuing with the project. They just need to make sure that they have um, properly conducted the environmental review, which I believe is uh, has not been finished yet. But we are all anxiously waiting um, and expect them to at least try to bulldoze through the prairie and we'll see you know, what the Natural Land Institute and others can do to try to prevent it. But we have very limited actions and, and all the, all the um, outcry and the, you know, attending meetings and getting people involved, you know, it was all went well, except the power is in the hand of a very, hands of a very few people. And they see it as more to gain uh, to mm -hmm. build their road mm -hmm. than to preserve the prairie. And it's, mm -hmm. it's very sad that at this point in time in Illinois, where we have so little left, and that this is a publicly owned, you know, entity in in the end that this could happen, and and so it's it's very concerning. Um, but I am on I am anxiously awaiting to see what will happen, uh, like everyone else. And from meetings I was in, there are alternatives. There are alternatives to to reach their goals and save it. Is there anything that people can do who are concerned about this, or it? Well, so I would I would suggest going to savebellbowlprairie.org. And at that website, uh, there should be all the information about public meetings. Um, I know they have some yard signs and, you know, various ways to get involved. So uh, um, I've, I've remained sort of peripherally involved since um, I don't live in the region, but I'm trying to, you know, get, keep the pressure on and stay informed. So I, I would say going to the website really should be the comprehensive place to know all about what's you know, going underway. Okay, wonderful. Chris, there's a question uh, about your, uh, the native range maps that you, that you have in your slides. Can you please explain the colors, the color key? Yeah, so um, let's see if I can put one back up here. Um, So if we go back to one of the maps, here we go. So um, if, if a plant occurs in a state, then the entire state is green, but only the counties in which it occurs are colored. So here's a good map. Um, you see Missouri is green because there's been at least one observation there, but that observation is in a county that's colored orange. And that orange means that it's no longer there, that we know it's been extirpated. So this would tell us that this, this species used to occur in Missouri in that one county and no longer does. In all the counties that are in yellow, that indicates that it has been observed in that county and it is rare. And as far as we know, extant, which means currently present. Uh, and then the light green means it occurs in that county and it's not rare. So this, again, I, I should mention, this is the um, Biota of North America program. So the acronym is BONAP, and they have range maps for all plant species known uh, in North America, or mainly the United States. Um, so it's a very, really useful website, and I want to make sure that they are properly acknowledged for their contribution. I wanted to ask you something. You were talking about how once, once it, a, a, a prairie or a natural land is disturbed, even if it's restored, it's never going to be the same. How successful do you find the attempt of Midowin to restore such a large area of tall grass prairie? you know, I'm sure you've been through there. How would you gauge their success and, and how difficult is that to try to restore such a huge area like that of disturbed, degraded land back into what they're hoping is going to be the largest tall grass prairie remnant east of the Mississippi, right? Yes. So Medewin is a magnificent um, project, but they're are no high quality prairie types known to occur there. 
and there hasn't been. So that means that it was significantly disturbed or degraded. Some of these natural communities are actually um, dependent on what we call disturbance, whether that's um, fire or like if it's sand, sand blows around. So I like to be specific um, and, and call it degradation, that the, the areas have been degraded. So Medewin had been significantly degraded over time to the point where by the natural areas inventory, no high quality natural communities were delineated there. So then it you know turned from the arsenal to um, the Department of Interior or uh, USDA and mm -hmm. it is a, a wonderful site and it's large, but it was primarily developed for birds, that there were grassland birds that need large areas of grassland to, uh, to breed. And so that is really the focus for the natural community there. They've done a lot of restoration. They, they, they grow plants in the greenhouse. They have a lot of volunteers. They're putting, you know, they collect seed. So a lot of restoration is happening there. Um, but it's, but to my knowledge, none of it is currently classified as a high quality prairie. There are a lot of rare plants that occur there. So it could be a nature preserve. We, we, when we look at nature preserves, it could be category one, which means a high quality natural community is present, or category two, which means rare or um, rare plants and animals are present. So there are rare plants there. In fact, some quite rare ones, but they're not mm -hmm. growing in a community type that is considered to be among the highest quality. Okay. Okay. And if we were to ask you as Sag Moraine, so Sag Moraine territory, we probably have people attending here from, from all over the Chicago area, but our, our territory is kind of the near West suburbs and the primarily the Southwest suburbs of Illinois. If we, uh, could like it next spring or summer is there a can we go on a tour or of some place in our area is there a, something in the Palis area that is a a good a good place to try to see some of these definitely definitely um you mean like with me as a guided trip yes or just, well, yeah yeah well I would love to do that that would be amazing um What's See, out here? You mentioned Camp Sowers. Yeah, so you know the, the the Palos Hills area is large, and that's one of you know it's a large. Um, there's a lot of land that Forest Preserve District owns. Camp Sagawa is has some nice Dolomite Prairie. Mm -hmm. um, trying to think um, offhand. Um, been a number of years since I've worked there. It was in there Willow Springs. There's there's something. Um, mm -hmm. There's a Palis Fen. There are there are sites. I'd have to look at the list, but um, okay. there's definitely places to to go visit there. That would be great botanical tour. That sounds yeah. like a great Sag Moraine spring or summer field trip. <laughs> definitely, definitely. So my my summer class runs from mid June to the first week of August. So that period is is very hard for me to get away. But if we do something in in May, um, okay. or perhaps in August, August is nice. I know it's it's hot, but you know the if it's especially if it's a prairie type, um, they really are in their full glory in the late summer. That's a good idea. That would be a great August trip. That's a good idea. Maybe it won't be in the 90s every day again like it was this year. Yeah, or you know, even September as things start to cool down a little bit, that that could be a, a potential opportunity as well. Chris, you keep mentioning um, natural communities, and as I was looking at your slides and your beautiful pictures, some of those flowers are just stunning, and I'd love to grow them in my backyard, but would they thrive there without their natural communities? And can you elaborate on what a natural community is? So a natural community is basically, you know, if you think about when Europeans arrived in, in Illinois, the whole state was a high quality natural condition, pretty much. You know, the indigenous people had been maintaining the landscape for thousands of years. And so, you know, everything was in a, a pretty high quality condition. And so most of it has been converted and de degraded in some way or another, you know, it's either it's uh, farmland or it's been developed with roads and, and homes and industry and such. Mm -hmm. So most of that is 
I guess you would still call it a particular natural community. It's just would be a really degraded one. So if you saw like a field, you know, where maybe like a pasture, you'd say this is a, a degraded, um, you know, dry mesic prairie, perhaps. But most of that has been so, you know, most of the pastures are so infiltrated with European forage grasses that they bear little resemblance to what it formerly was. So our high quality natural communities are the remnants. It's, it's a piece of, you know, remaining landscape that has not been significantly altered. Oh, and growing plants. I actually yeah. have a talk that is taught, titled Wildflowers uh, for the Home Garden. And a, a number of them uh, were in this slideshow. So yes, you can obtain and grow uh, a lot of Illinois you know, vegetation, beautiful wildflowers um, in a garden setting. Including mm -hmm. some of those rare ones, the listed ones. And would that help if they, if, if they are listed, if we grow them in our gardens, does that help or do they count those? Um, well, I know that, so it gets a little bit tricky, I think, and I'm not well versed on the rules, honestly, of, um, of that, but Prairie Moon Nursery in Minnesota actually is terrific, and you can buy leafy prairie clover there. <laughs> you can buy, um, you know, a number of our rare species from them. I'm not sure. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not really a grower or a gardener, so I don't have experience with this, but we have a number of native plant nurseries in Illinois, and so you can buy plants or you can buy seed, and you can. Uh, them. In fact, a number of volunteers like Steve Packard, I mentioned, they actually uh, collect seed from some of these sites and they grow them in their yards, their suburban yard, and then they transplant them later. Um, so oh. there's a number of things that can be done. But to be honest with you, I'm not sure, you know, you certainly wouldn't want to take anything, you know, from the wild in Illinois. Mm -hmm. But I think you can obtain them legally and and grow them in your yard. And that would be good. I mean, you think about a lot of these plants have specialized insects and things that are the, they're exactly. the host plant for. And so you're definitely helping wildlife um, by planting some of these. But to be honest, as long as you have native plants in the landscape, something is going to benefit. And that should really be, you know, that could, could be a focus for uh, landowners making their own contribution to help nature. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think we have one more comment here. Um, Liz wanted to share that the Sierra Club, uh, the Northwest chapter and perhaps other chapters has been involved in fighting against the air, the Belleville Airport, uh, the, the Rockford Airport road and other damage potentials of Belleville Prairie. Uh, she said to contact the Sierra Club uh, for more information on their legal fight. Okay, that's good information. All righty. Any more questions, Mayor? I don't see any other questions. Well, this was this was terrific, Chris. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I mean, it just was so eye-opening how, I mean, we think of expressways and big buildings and you keep showing these plants that are here oh, wow. and it's like, wow, it really shows you how important every landscape is. And I know, and I've also read that even when it comes to a lot of our um declining birds and even some of the bees. I mean, some of our cities and suburbs are their best hope. Yep, it's very true, very true. You know, even in the urban landscape, it, it's 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 better than a, you know, sterilized farmland basically. And so even though you, you might see central Illinois is, you know, not, not developed in an urban sense, um, you know, we, we've converted all that land for other uses. So there's definitely a lot that can be done um, on, you know, we, we need, places for plants to be able to grow. And whether they're in your yard or in a forest preserve or wherever, um, those are places to focus on. Exactly, yeah. wonderful. Um, Diane says, what an amazing talk. Thanks, Chris. Yes, thank you so much, Chris. And you're gonna be hearing from me. I wanna have an in-person uh, field trip next year. What do you say, Mary? I love it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sounds terrific, we'll work it out. Thank you so much and thank you everyone for attending. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night.